Hi, um, I would like to start with a very short question. So, who is aware of the Python Global Interpreter Log? Okay, who likes the Python Global Interpreter Log? Okay, who had problems with the Python Interpreter Log? Okay, we will see. Maybe we can fix some of that problems. But first of all, I would like to give you some bit of background. Um, what I'm actually doing? Um, I'm actually a software engineer, but I don't know why I'm always doing quality assurance uh, all the day. Um, basically, I'm doing quality assurance um, inside of a team of SAP for SAP HANA, which is a big in-memory database for enterprise products and so on. HANA itself is not written Python, but all the tests are written Python, all the testing infrastructure is written Python. Um, that also means that we run a huge test infrastructure to do quality assurance. It's one of our main pillars for quality assurance. And we are testing around 800 commits every single day. And therefore, we run a slight small infrastructure of 1,600 machines with a lot of memory. In memory database, lives in memory. We need a lot of memory. So we have, at the moment, around 610 terabyte of memory, but um, that change over time all the time. And um, yeah, I'm actually a software engineer. So what I do is develop software, develop services, develop tools for this infrastructure. And as they're written Python, I'm now here to talk a bit about that. And um, regarding the problem, or my problem with the girl, I would like to show you how we actually run tests and how we distribute tests across our servers. Therefore, we actually have a dedicated framework, a dedicated task distribution framework, which is built on top of Apache Mesos. And Apache Mesos is something like Kubernetes. It's a bit older than Kubernetes. Therefore, it's not so cool than Kubernetes and so on. Nevertheless, at the end, Apache Mesos receives various kinds of resource offers from our various data centers, cloud providers, and so on. Mesos will send over this resource offers to our task scheduler. Our task scheduler is responsible to take tasks from our test scheduling and then schedule certain tasks, certain tests on the available resources. And the task scheduler itself is a bigger application. It's integrated with various other services, also in own persistency and so on. But the good thing is the task editor is written in Python, therefore everything is solved basically. Until we actually had a small problem, which is a luxury problem, because we added more and more machines in our data centers, and at some point we basically hit scalability issues. So our task editor received so many incoming messages with so so many available resources and status updates and so on, that it was actually not fast enough anymore to schedule new tasks on top of the available resources, which is a bit of a problem if you cannot really utilize all your available resources. And one theory that we now had is, okay, we have to take a deeper look into the task scheduler. We need to optimize that. And to understand how the task scheduler internally works, I have a small semantic overview of that. We have a lot of threads. So it's written Python. We have a lot of threads. It should be okay because, I mean, we have a lot of I.O. traffic and, I, and I.O. work. So we, we are doing, for example, in various threads, I.O. requests to databases, to other services, and so on. They will release the gill, everything is fine, so it will scale well. That was the assumption. But it didn't work out so well, and we have now to analyze the problem. The good news is, we actually have also an observability stack, which should support us in analyzing that. So the first thing that we did is actually taking a look on, okay, what is our offer handling thread doing? So that's the thread who receives all the incoming offers of resources and tries to schedule work on that offers. This is a semantic overview um, of the thread, how the thread goes over um, various offers. And there are some quite interesting spots which should 
which look a bit suspicious. And I would like to go through um, of them. So the first thing is there are operations which should run in the same time, but there are different runtimes of the same operation, which is a bit strange, especially there's a huge variance of the runtime. The second thing is, with our distributed tracing approach, we could also see how long certain operation, uh, operation take in the upstream or downstream service. So in this particular example, the task scheduler is doing a request to another service. Within the task scheduler, it looks like the request takes around 200 milliseconds, but the other service is actually reporting, I process the request in uh, 30 milliseconds. This looks also a bit strange. And the third thing is that there are certain gaps between uh, operations which should actually not occur. Um, you can see on the prepare task operation, it runs in 545 uh, milliseconds, and it should only contain two API calls, but there are certain gaps in between, which is a bit strange. The assumption was now, and because, I mean, we are talking about threads and people would like to get rid of threads and so on, okay, it must be something with the girl. There are threads, they, they are releasing the girl, and then they have a hard time actually to reacquire the global interpreter log, and therefore we have now a performance problem. But the nice thing is, actually, we can easily mitigate the gill contention. There are various ways to mitigate the gill. So probably the most prominent thing is nowadays just replace multi-threading with async IO or replace multi-threading with multi-processing and async IO or just move all CPU intensive workload into Siphon because there you can actually release the gill if possible. Or why should we actually use Python uh, at that level of scale? We could just rewrite everything, for example, Rust, Go, whatever. The truth is, rewriting and also refactoring is actually expensive. I mean, it takes some time. You have two systems in parallel most of the time. You have to maintain still the old system while you rewrite it in the new language. It's very expensive. And you normally don't want to do that. So the plan was now actually to step, uh, to go one step back and say, okay, maybe we should first verify that is, is actually a problem with the global interpreter log. And then based on the collected data, where we actually prove that it's a problem with the global interpreter log, we can start to think about a better solution. Okay. Now we should take a look at the kill. Cannot be so complicated, right? I mean, something like import sys get Gill starts? No, doesn't work like that. Uh, there is sadly no public API yet to acquire such Gill statistics from the CPython interpreter at the moment. Okay, so how do I now can actually analyze the Gill? And the nice thing is, I'm not the not the first person who actually had that problem. I'm one of the later person probably. Um, and there are other talks and other related works to that. So, for example, there is a nice talk of Dave Baisley on a, a on a previous PyCon. It's actually a bit older. It's from 2010, but most of the uh, things are still valid because the GIL doesn't change so often. Um, to understand, okay, how does the GIL actually perform? How how often do we have a GIL log contention and so on? And there is also some uh, nice uh, results how we actually modified the CPython interpreter to get results of the CPython interpreter to generate this nice picture to visualize the GIL contention, which is quite nice. The problem is it is actually implemented for uh, CPython 2.6 and our scheduler works with CPython 3.7, so it's not so easy to adapt that. Therefore, we have to look for something else. And then I remember, ah, there is maybe something in one of the IDEs. PyCharm has some nice concurrency view on that. Yes, 
PyCharm can visualize threads and log contentions in a nice concurrency view, but it actually omits the girl. Doesn't help me in my case now. There's another very interesting tool. It's called um, Gil Load, which you can attach or which you can integrate in your application, and then it will print out statistic regarding the girl. Um, in this example, I just run an application which is highly bound to the global interpreter log, and we see, okay, yes, I have a gill load of one, but I actually don't have additional information about that. I don't know, okay, which thread is now suffering from that, or which thread is holding the gill, how long, and so on. Doesn't help me, uh, doesn't help in that case now. There is actually a very, very interesting project at the moment, PySpy, which is an um, assembling profiler for Python, uh, written in Rust. Um, but, I mean, from that perspective, it's very nice because we can use Rust to instrument Python and get some statistics. That's not so bad. Um, and it's also quite fast. Um, the, the problem is, at the moment, it only shows the gil usage in a percent number. But I just read that there are actually now new features, which I actually didn't try it out yet, um, so that it should also provide you additional information regarding the gil. But as I had this problem some months ago, the feature was not available yet. So the typical answer for that is, okay, I have to build that by myself. Which is not so great, but there's a simple solution for that. There is already some framework within CPython to build such type of instrumentation. This base is actually SystemTab. SystemTab is an instrumentation tool for Linux, which allows you to add certain markers in your applications. And at runtime, you can attach so-called uh, so probes to that markers and the probes will be invoked every time the application hits a certain marker. Which is quite nice, because with that you can actually write a system tab script that will be always called, sorry, the probe inside of the system tab script will be called every time you, for example, enter a Python function or you exit a Python function. Also, there's a very great documentation regarding CPython, SystemTab, and DTrace, and how you can use it. But there are basically two main problems. The first problem is most pre-built Linux packages are not compiled with the DTrace flag, so you don't have access to that markers. And the second problem is there's, there are actually no GIL-related markers yet, so you cannot really attach to the GIL-related events uh, in the way that you can analyze it. But actually, even if I'm not so familiar with C, it was not that complicated to add them. So this is the full patch, basically, to add two markers. At the end, I needed three markers, um, so that I now can actually instrument CPython and can uh, add certain probes um, at these markers and retrieve the timing information of the gil time. You may ask now, okay, why I call actually Python get thread ident? This is a nice feature of system tab. You can actually add additional attributes to a marker so that within your um, system tab script, you can actually access these attributes and use them. And here I now use actually the Python uh, thread indent method to get the ID of the Python thread. Sadly, there is no C API to get a thread name. Uh, otherwise, it would be even more uh, comfortable for me to get an idea, okay, which thread is now uh, uh, acquiring the girl. Okay. If I now compile my special C Python version with these markers, I can attach a script to it. But what type of script do I actually attach to that? Um, therefore, um, I have an example of that, which you can also reuse. Um, this is a, a system tab 
script and every probe will be attached to your Python interpreter. And every time a thread will now try to claim the gil, will now invoke the certain probe, or every time a thread acquired actually the gil will um, call into that script, and every time a thread dropped the global interpreter log, will also go into the script. And here it's a very simple implementation of um, measuring the time. So what I do is Every time a thread tries to claim the gill, we wrote down the time um, of today in nanoseconds, store them in a hash map with the, front, uh, with the current thread ID. Every time I acquired the gill, or the thread acquired the gill, we just store, okay, how long was the wait time? And I store that in a histogram, which is a special system type uh, data type. And the same thing also applies for guild drop. There, I also store the time. Okay, how long I actually hold the guild. Okay, now I have the timing information, and I can now use this timing information, but I can actually not see the timing information because they are now stored in this strange histogram data type sensor. The nice thing is, actually, we can now visualize that. By just printing out all the type, uh, all the data from a system tab. Um, there are two special probes which will be invoked every time you attach a system tab script to a Python interpreter or if you terminate this system tab process. And at the termination of the system tab process, we can print out what are the stored data inside of the histograms so that I can see for each thread, okay, how long was the wait time, how long was the whole time, and so on and so on. And now maybe this is a bit abstract and not so easy to follow. Therefore, I would like to show an example how it actually looks. So let's take a look on the first experiment, which is a process with two I.O. bound threads. And the way how I simulated an I.O. bound thread is quite simple. I just call time.sleep because time to sleep will actually release the gill just before the thread will went into the sleep state. So we basically just simulate the same process like you would have if you read from a socket or write uh, to a socket and so on. So now I can start that um, Python, uh, Python process with this super simple but still useful application. And at the end, and I detach my system tab uh, process from it, I get a summary. And what I can see now is, okay, I have three threads. One is the main thread. The two other threads are my I.O. threads. And I have the aggregated numbers for the wait time and the hold time. And overall, I see actually, okay, overall, I just hold the gill around 0 0.2. Uh, 2% of uh, the runtime. So looks like my application is not that busy with executing Python instructions. And there's probably nearly no contention because the wait time overall is super low. Um, we can now change that and introduce another thread in another experiment with a CPU bound thread. And how do you generate a CPU bound thread? I could now train some complicated machine learning model or do something else. Or I can just implement a while loop, which is just while true and is wasting CPU cycles. Okay, but that works for, uh, for the moment. And now we can take another look on the results. So overall, uh, we have now four threads. Surprise, surprise. We have the main thread. Okay, we have the I.O. thread. Interesting, the wait time is already significant increased. Whole time still quite low because I mean, just have to go again over the while loop, um, change the, the uh, value of n and so on. Um, also, the second IO thread has the same problem, also increased wait time. But the CPU thread, the CPU thread has actually no, no big problem. Wait time looks quite good. 
hold time, okay, is huge. And if we take a look on the overall result, okay, we basically have all the time some thread which is holding the gill, so we are um, running all the time real Python instruction because, I mean, we have to execute the pass command in our CPU spinning thread. The nice thing is with the system tab histograms, you can also get a better overview regarding the distribution of the values instead of just aggregates. So, and what I found quite interesting, and I was totally not aware of that, is that the wait time is actually quite stable. So the wait time is very stable between 4 and 8 milliseconds. And I was a bit confused about that. But overall, what I can say already is that every I.O. thread already suffered just from this one single CPU-bound thread. So what I can say is basically, okay, the guild contention already affects my overall application performance. And now I would also like to go a bit more into the detail regarding this 5 milliseconds, because it was quite strange to me. I would expect that there are some fluctuations or something like that. But it was very stable all the time. I reproduced it all the time, and I just thought about where are these 5 milliseconds coming from. And then I learned also from the talk of Dave Basley that there's actually a so-called switch interval within the Python interpreter. And the, the trick is of the new global interpreter log that the switch interval is some kind of a grace period um, for a thread that would like to acquire the girl. So if you would, if a thread would like to acquire the girl, he will mark a flag, I would like to have the girl, and will wait until the girl is free again. But if this one runs into a timeout, which is actually the switch interval, then it will set another flag where uh, the thread is actually requesting that the current holding thread should please drop the girl. So that means if I have now a CPU bound applica uh, a CPU bound thread that basically all the time is iterating over Python instructions, it will at least an, an IO thread is at least to wait until the switch interval before there is a chance that this CPU bound thread who will never release the gill uh, without any uh, external invocation um, until the I.O. thread will actually acquire the girl. Disclaimer, this don't have to be true because at the end this drop request will be checked every time you execute a new Python instruction, a new Python operation. That means if you have a bytecode operation that takes much longer than five milliseconds, the switch interval will not help you. Also, the same thing applies to external C functions. If you call out to, his, to an external C function that holds the global interpreter log, hopefully the function will come back at some point in time and will release the game. Okay, so much to the theory. Let's go back into real production. I mean, now we have some basic rudimentary tool to actually analyze the girl. So the plan should be quite straightforward. We deploy a new container with the task scheduler, with this customized CPython version and system tab. We attach system tab to the process, collecting all the data. And at the end, we have a clear result and insights what's going on. Reality is a bit different. Uh, deploying the container with the customer CPython version was the easiest part. Um, the problem was then to actually find out, okay, how can I actually use system tab inside of a Docker container? That's not so easy. Um, because at the end, what you have to know is that system tab is actually generating a kernel module out of this system tab script and will load this inside of your Linux kernel at runtime to collect all that kind of data. That means you need a full toolchain with compiler and so on, kernel sources, and a lot of other stuff. 
that's not so nice, and I'm pretty sure every security team will be not so happy about that if you load some custom kernel extension at runtime in your productive environment. But somehow it worked out, and I had a huge file, a huge text file with report. And surprise, surprise, what I found out, I actually have a problem with the gel because um, we use the gel um, over 80% of the time, but nearly 300% of the time there were threads who just waited for the gel. Okay, that doesn't look so good. Um, but at the end, I could prove we actually have now a problem with the global interpreter log. There is some contention. But it also raised a lot of questions. It raised the question, okay, what is actually this bad thread who holds the gill so long? Is it maybe holding the gill longer than 5 milliseconds? I actually assumed that our process is fully I.O. bound. So no thread should actually hold um, the gill longer than 5 milliseconds. Um, and if so, then I probably would like to know, okay, which function is it, is that, and so on. And maybe there are some kind of patterns that we could identify. The reality is, inside of our task scheduler, we have over 30 threads. So the text report was not the best way to visualize that and to analyze that problem. And I thought, okay, there must be a better way. So at the end, I'm actually a big fan of our distributed tracing approach because I like such timelines. I'm not best person about data visualization, but at least I can understand such types of data visualization. So the idea was, okay, could we maybe create something like that for the gill? And the result is, yes, we can, because this is the nice benefit of Python and the Python ecosystem with all these nice data visualization tools that there are tools to generate nice-looking visualizations. So what I did is collecting all the data with system tab, with this magic kernel extension and so on, store them, load them in a, into a Jupyter notebook, and then transform some data and do some transformation, what else? And at the end, I have a nice looking visualization with Buki. Okay, I did that. I'm not 100% sure how I was able to do that. Probably it's related with the uh, a very nice documentation of all these various tools. Um, that's basically now the visualization. Um, these are now two seconds of our task scheduler. Um, looks huge um, and also a bit interesting because each red area actually indicates an area where we actually wait for the gill. And as it's now some, um, some time slice, um, with the increased size of the block, it also takes more time. So each big red block is not that great. But even worse are the blocks which are dark blue because they hold the gill longer than 100 milliseconds. So, I mean, this is now um, the visualization for, for two seconds. We can zoom in a bit, zoom in a bit, zoom in a bit. And at the end, I saw, okay, there is one thread with big blue blocks all the time. And then I was so used to nice looking visualization so that I didn't open the text report anymore and so on. I just looked at a Jupyter notebook and found out, okay, how can I actually create a pie chart? Even you shouldn't use a pie chart as I learned from various data visualization people. But at the end I found out, okay, we waste most of our time with the girl in a thread who is collecting metrics. Which is not that great, um, as you can imagine. Because, um, yeah, while collecting metrics and crunching some data on and, and send them over to our uh, observability state, we just wasted 
compute resources and so on. Not that nice. But the nice thing is that it actually made it much easier to fix the problem. So because with the various visualization and some timing information, it was quite easy to find out, okay, which, where we actually now waste the global interpreter lock time. And the result was we actually waste most of the time in a C extension that is just not releasing the GIL because it, the C extension is actually using all the time Python data, therefore the C extension has to hold the GIL all the time. Which is not always a thing that you have in mind because m most people probably think I use the C extension, yeah, it will release the GIL. I have no problem. That's not a, uh, a problem for me. I have no, no GIL problem because I use C extensions. They are fast. They are super fast. But as we can see here, that's not always the case. But the nice thing is with that, it was quite easy to fix the problem. So we just started to replace the C extension with some other coding, which we anyhow plan for the future. And we just found out, okay, probably we don't need metrics every 10 seconds. It is probably enough to collect the metrics every two minutes. And afterwards, it was super easy uh, to get better results. Um, the results are still not super great. I mean, we now still wait around 80% of the time f for the gill, which is not good. I mean, there are, there are um, things that we can definitely improve. But what I would like to emphasize is that with a simple fix, and to be honest, it would probably well, would be totally enough to just change that part in our application, which is one config parameter. We actually solved our GIL contention. But at the beginning, we were not aware that we actually have a GIL contention problem. We were not aware that um, where we actually had a GIL contention problem. So this journey was quite interesting for us to find actually out, okay, what is now the problem and how can we fix that? So there are various things. Um, that I would like to talk more about, but I mean, we don't have enough time. Um, but one thing I would like to mention is I think there are various additional ideas regarding instrumentation of CPython and regarding observability of CPython. Um, and what I would like to do is actually to, to open source all the tool set and so on. I mean, within this presentation, all the system tab scripts and so on, they should already be enough to um, to collect the data and to, to um, uh, get an overview regarding the global interpreter log uh, of your applications. But what I would actually like to do is to um, yeah open source all the additional system tab um, scripts and visualization coding um, and also um, what I think would be nice if we could maybe either integrate the additional GIL markers into CPython or maybe there are other ways how we can collect the data. So I had some talks with various people already about that. So there may be some more efficient ways how we could collect the data. And maybe at a later point in time, there could be some nice user-facing API that is actually providing all the required data over a simple Python API. Uh, which would be quite nice because, I mean, then it would be possible to integrate that into the various observability stacks, observability tools. You could, for example, integrate it in your logging, in your distributed tracing approach, whatever. If you are interested about the GIL or about GIL contention, GIL instrumentation, or observability in general, then please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christoph. So uh, we have time for questions. So uh, anybody want to ask questions? Yep. About Gil. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that's a. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, I have a question. So um, in the case that you show us, um, what would be the danger of doing that? Do you, can you think of like a case that we maybe should not do the same thing? So using system tab for for instrumenting uh, your your application. So you mean what the danger of that is, or, or what is the, the exact question? Yeah, is it like a case that um, maybe is not that helpful, or maybe we should avoid doing that? Um, is there any danger of doing it, or is it like a good thing that we should always do it? <laughs> I mean, every type of instrumentation comes with a cost. So if you instrument too much, and if you collect maybe too often the same metrics, that can hurt. Um, so um, from from that perspective. Um, it is probably not a big problem to just try it out and find out, okay, do I have a gill contention problem? Um, because if you know that you don't have a gill contention problem, then you don't have to waste time to think about, okay, how can I now actually solve my gill contention problem? Because you don't have the problem. Um, it's the typical don't optimize in areas when you are not, a um, when you are not 100% sure that you actually have a problem in that area. So I think everyone should maybe try out if um, the, the person thinks, okay, there is probably a performance bottleneck and it could be the global interpreter lock of Python. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yep, there's one question. Um, in uh, follow-up to that question, actually, uh, did you observe a meaningful overhead to the changes you introduced to test it? Um, so, with the with the usage of, of system tab, I mean, I, I use an instrumentation tool which is uh, already well optimized. I mean, it's basically for kernel development. Um, so the, the overhead of that is quite low, um, and it was was able to use that in production. And I actually didn't saw any big additional overhead in our application metrics. Um, so from that perspective, I think it would be fine. Um, but from um, conversations with some um, yeah, Python core developers, I already learned, okay, maybe in this area of the guild, it is not so good to add additional system type markers because they come also with some small overhead, even if you don't attach a system tab process uh, to it. Um, but, I mean, that's something you just probably have to measure because, I mean, it's the same thing. It's um, always the problem with performance. If you don't measure it, you don't know what is actually going on. Thank you. So... In layman's terms, I'd like to know how big of a problem it is globally, because there's millions of people, and up until today, me included, who write Python code and never even think of that 75% of the time it does something not related to the code that I wrote. Is it something that most people should consider, or some people should consider? So, what I wouldn't like to say is that the gill is a problem because I think most applications actually don't suffer from a gill contention, um, especially as most, um, for example, C extensions and so on, they also release the gill. I mean, um, I'm not a NumPy expert, but my expectation is NumPy is highly optimized in that and it uses its own data structures, so there should be no need to hold the gill all the time. So from, from that perspective, I think... Most people are probably not affected by that, um, but I mean, sometimes in, if you if you just suffer from a performance problem and you have no idea um, what could be the root cause of that, it is probably uh, useful to just check it out if it's the gill. And I mean, with especially the, the new tools, um, for for example, um, what what I show uh, PySpy. Um, there we are talking about a single binary that you can just attach to a running process. And over there you have a, a percentage number how much of the time you actually hold the gill. And if this is not 100%, I would just 
don't do this magic stuff with system tap and so on. I would just be, okay, I probably don't have a guild problem. So that's the simple solution. And I mean, there's a lot of um, work going on in PySpy, so I would highly recommend to, to check it out. So, oh, uh, maybe one last question. Who really want to ask? Okay, yeah, this is the last question. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. Um, are you aware of any other instrumentation libraries like uh, BPF Trace, which is uh, relatively new and uh, was uh, integrated in the mainline kernel where you don't have to have um, compiled code that you load um, to instrument? Um, yeah, so maybe that is one problem. Uh that we actually run enterprise software. So we also run enterprise Linux distributions. So there is some delay. Um, so we actually don't have access uh, to the nice kernel features um, like eBPF. So, um, but I think that will be probably simplify a lot of that stuff. And I don't see uh, any reason why we shouldn't be able to build a similar instrumentation with system, um, as I did with system tab, also with eBPF, for example. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Christoph, for a good talk and uh, also answering uh, so many questions. Um, so, uh, what's gonna happen next will be, uh, we will have a communal space, uh, community space from 10 minutes, for 10 minutes. And then afterwards, uh, because, uh, today there's uh, some change in the schedule, so we won't have the uh, keynote talk afterwards. So we will start the live stream talk early, uh, start at five, and then, uh, um, we will try to have as much live stream talk as we can, and then and um, so if you're giving a lightning talk, please come back at five. And also, uh, actually, everybody, please come back at five because uh, it's, the, it's uh, the best session of the conference. So, yeah, uh, I'll see you soon. <laughs>